Cardle from the University of Aberdeen welcome you to the North Alliance's mini MOOC. I'd like to introduce some people to you. With us today we have Ramon al who's, hello Ramon, and Ramon's going to be taking your questions and feeding them to our guest speakers today. Um, supporting us we have our educational technology consultant Phil Marston who may come in at, at any time if we have techn technological issues that we would need to, to deal with. Um, today, I'm absolutely delighted that we have two guest speakers who are going to give a keynote address for us, and they are Cass Stewart and Lucy Maynard. Cass Stewart is Head of Research and Evaluation at the Braithay Trust, which is in Cumbria, England. She established the Braithay Research Hub in two 2010, to, as she said, to literally be a hub of research activity. She's passionate about participative action research that helps us to understand people's lived experience and that gives voice to those who are most silenced. I'm also delighted to have Lucy Maynard with us, who is a research assistant in the Braithe Research Hub. And she says her job involves bringing theory and practice together. In particular, she enjoys supporting people to create deeper, deeper understanding of experiences, evidencing these and facilitating subsequent change, i.e. participatory action research. This may be with participants, practitioners, or organizations. She also has a passionate belief in empowerment and critical pedagogy. So please, Ramon's waiting for your questions, so please be sure to pass your questions on for Kaz and Lucy. And I'll now hand over to Lucy, who's going to start us off. Thanks, Karen. Um, so what Kaz and I want to talk about today um, is a little bit about empowerment, structure, and agency. Um, it started with my PhD research, uh, which was uh, nearly five years ago, which is quite scary. Um, and it's developed since then. Um, and Kaz has taken the research on um, and developed some of that herself. Hi, my name's Kaz. Um, it's nice to meet you all. Uh, my PhD research at the moment has been investigating ways in which people collaborate um, to achieve positive things in communities. Um, and I got really interested in the notion of structure and agency. Uh, myself and Lucy found that our two areas of research were really complementary. So what we've done is bring them together and that's what we're presenting to you today. Um, could you advance the slide, Phil? So what we're going to do is we'd really like you to um, listen to a story that we have from practice. Um, and that is a story from a young woman called Gemma. And what Gemma does is she helps us uh, understand the process of empowerment. Um, and it's just one of many stories that we've collected. Um, hers is a particularly powerful story, so I'll share that with you. And then share a model of empowerment um, that we deliver, de uh, developed as a framework for practice. And that kind of um, led us on to empowerment as collective action. And then Kaz will go on to talk about um, understanding structures. Do you want to say about that, Kaz? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, after Lucy's talked about empowerment, then I'll introduce you to the notion of different structures um, and how the different structures interplay with each other. Uh, and then we'll look at agency, which we've positioned as the activity that people carry out that's the interface between empowerment and um, structural change. Great. So um, Gemma's story, if you'd like to move the slide, Phil. Um, Gemma's story... Uh, came from uh, the research that I did for my PhD um, and I just want to take you through it and invite you to listen to the story and um, what she has to tell us really. Uh, we de developed this story over a number of years. Um, I worked with um, the Young Women's Group um, for two years and then I worked with Gemma for four years actually in total, keeping in contact with her. The context of that is um, the organisation we work for, Bray They Trust, we worked with a local service um, and the service uh, were working with young women who are at risk of sexual exploitation or were involved in sexual exploitation. Um, so the story is um, very real and could be quite emotional for people. There is some colourful language in there. Um, I have changed some of the language, but we'll discuss that later about should we change some of the language, um, because that would be me kind of asserting my power over Gemma. Um, but this is Gemma's story. It is very real. Um, and her, Gemma wasn't her real name, that's a pseudonym, um, but I just want to share that with you. You can advance the slide, Phil. Gemma sat in one of the group rooms, arms crossed around her knees, pulled up to her chin, hood up. She looked tiny, 
height and size. She had long brown hair, mostly worn swept back in a ponytail. She wore trackies and hoodies and smoked a lot. She swore a lot too, but was also incredibly polite and respectful. If you deserved it, that is. She could portray a nasty side if she needed to, to protect herself, I think. She had quite a fire, fiery round of verbal am ammunition for anyone if she needed it. I think she had to act tough to survive in her world. But she, like many of the other young women we worked with, this was not the real Gemma, the one we came to know through the course. The training team, key workers and I, came to admire her for her courage, her grit, and combined with her wit and her genuineness. Gemma said, life was real bad before, all life, home, school. I wanted to change, change my behavior. I was naughty and ran off a lot. I wanted to make my behavior better and my personality as well, to a good way. I was a right idiot back then. Gemma was 13 years old when I first met her and at risk of being sexually exploited through her mum's work as a prostitute and associated class A drug habit. Gemma rarely attended school, drank alcohol regularly and ran away from home and her grandparents' care. Gemma cared greatly about her mum, so much so that sometimes she would pick her up off the floor when she'd used drugs, laying her on the couch and staying with her in case she OD'd. Gemma recalled, I want to change the situation I'm in, but until my mum changes the situation she's in, it's not going to change my situation. I don't even know where to start. I mean, I don't even know where I live, and I know that may so sound stupid, but I don't. At the beginning of the course, the young women were asked to tie knots in a piece of rope, metaphorically representing current negative knots in their life, with the spaces between the knots representing positive aspects. Gemma immediately tied her rope into a mass of knots. Simply, this was her life at the moment. A couple of days into the course, Gemma untied her rope and replaced the mass with a single smaller knot. She explained, I don't know, it just feels right. Something feels weird, like I'm changing. I want to undo that knot too. I think it would be great, but, but I'm scared. I can't quite bring myself to do it. Not ready to undo it, Gemma loosened the knot to see how that felt. It was clear that change was happening for her, which was shifting some of her knots. Gemma was at a junction in her life journey. She was facing decisions about where she was going. Her mum wanted her to go home, but her social worker suggested she would be safer at her grandparents. Another junction was added to Gemma's journey when someone on the course told her about her experiences of living in foster care. It appealed to Gemma that she could see her mum on her own terms and when her mum wasn't using. She said, it got to the point where the police came to photograph some bruising resulting from a beating from her mum. Billy told me about foster care. I didn't believe it would be that rosy, but it is. When I met with Gemma three weeks later, she had removed herself from her mother's care, was listening to social services and was now listening, uh, was now living in foster care and was going back to school. This was the case three months on. She said, I've changed the way I act, my personality. I'm more mature. I know this because of some of the decisions I've had to make, like foster care, leaving my mum, my nan and my family to go and live with someone that I don't know. But I'm glad I did it. I don't know where I'd have been now. Bray they changed my life, the way I am. I was sad to go, leave Bray they, but pleased with myself for sticking at it. I had three chances to run, but I'm proud of me for staying. The things we've been doing, I mean, it could change somebody. It's so weird. I feel like I can do anything. Positive comments from people and stuff all the time. Well, it just makes you think. So what Gemma can tell us here, and Phil, if you can move the slide forward, is she tells us uh, of, of her experience. And this experience we came to understand from Gemma and other people as her being in a reactive place. And this was represented at the bottom of this model of empowerment um, with the red square uh, as a reactive state. She was reacting to the world around her. She was going with the flow. She was in the status quo. 
And what happened um, is, is the course happened and she called it positive comments from people or being away. Um, and this we felt was like a sparking and we called it sparking and I've, I've represented it as plus and minus because I think this can be a positive or a negative spark. I think in Gemma's case it could have been either um, a positive spark, maybe the course, um, guessing way, uh, people listening to her for perhaps the first time, a negative one could have been an assault, abuse, violence and it just something sparked, other young people have called it a light bulb moment. And it's that place where you're just like, what's going on? Hang on a minute. And she started to realize that maybe things didn't have to be this way. Um, and she didn't know those things before because she was in her world. She hadn't been exposed to other worlds. And this realization led to a wanting. Um, she wanted something new, different. Um, and this was really typical of um, all the young women we worked with at the time and now we're seeing in other cases uh, and not just young people. Um, and this whole thing we felt was like a process of self-awareness or awareness raising. Um, and it was a reflective place. Um, but there was a movement at this point from the wanting um, and that was a proactive commitment and that was directly opposing to the reactive state they had been in. Uh, and so it was a movement, a tipping point, I guess, um, from this uh, reflection and self-awareness towards action and doing something about it. And so they were proactive and they started to seek out help. How can I make a change? How can I make a difference? And this was a really, really crucial point because potentially I would argue that previously people might come in at the how stage um, and they might be telling. Um, telling people that she needs to move out of home um, or in other situations telling uh, telling the young person that boy's no good for you and um, and Gemma was pushing those people away definitely um, but what's happened is she's had this intrinsic process that she's come to this point herself no one's told her she's come to it herself and now she's seeking out how she can do it for herself um, which is much more powerful. So previously when she pushed people away, she's now seeking their help. Um, and in, in this case from social services. So she started to find out how. Um, she then started to transfer this um, into other situations um, after the course, um, different aspects of the course. And, and she actually sustained this. And so this is represented in the model. Um, as this process of empowerment where she's cyclically resourceful. This is a resourceful cycle where she's learning how she's transferring it to new situations and she's sustaining this over time. Um, and this is upwardly spiraling. Um, she was flourishing and she was resourceful. Um, and this was really evident that she was on her way and transferring things to new situations. However, um, I want to go back to the story. Um, because this is all lovely, um, but it's, it's actually not the whole story. Gemma's situation changed yet again, circling round as she called it. She said angrily towards her mum, me mother, she has to keep ringing me. This has happened, this has happened, I need you to come down. Every two days she'd be ringing me, I need you to come down. She'd ring me and tell me what happened. Like say, like that freak Jake, she'd say to me, like Jake's done this like when Jake sm smashed the window on the house and she'd be like, Jake's done this, I need you to come down. After this, Gemma ran off from care and back to her mum's house. The case got closed. They said she would keep running back to her mum's and so there's no point. Apparently, the social worker didn't even do this in person. She did it by letter. Gemma said, yeah, that didn't go down very well either. I got the worst end of that off me mum. It was all my fault. She just don't give a toss. She should, though. She just doesn't care. Yeah, getting her next fix, that's all she does care about. Gemma stayed with her mum for about six months. Only Sally, her support worker from the Young Women's Project, was working with her because the case had apparently been closed with social services. She told me about the time when her mum beat her with a hammer. She listed, police picked me up from my mum's and took me to my nan's, stayed at my nan's since, until it started to fall apart at my nan's, didn't it? Dad hit me, so I was put in children's home. I weren't staying there, so I ran off back to my mum's. Police took me from, no wait, no they didn't, hang on. I went back to my nan's, police picked me up from my mum's, took me to my nan's, stayed at my nan's for two nights. Social services said they'd try and find me foster placement. 
They weren't funding, so now I'm back at my mum's. No situation's changed. They're saying I can live there because they can't find nowhere for me to go. I'm allowed to stay at my mum's. She's hit me with a hammer and we've been fighting like cat and dog and she's using heroin in front of me. I mean... I asked her, so what does your mum say after she's given you a bit of a pummeling or thrown the TV at you like you said? What does she say about it? Nothing. It's never mentioned. And my mum's never mentioned it. And if I don't mention it, oh, I'm never going to mention it. So does all of this come from an argument? And what usually starts an argument? She interrupted me when I'm drunk. I'm not going to sit here and say it's not me because I know that sometimes it is me. But no matter how far I go, you don't hit your own kid with a hammer, do you? Unless you're trying to stab you or something. Like, but you never do. You never, you never hit your own kid with a hammer. She said, no charges ever came from the hammer incident. How can I send my own mum to jail? Because I still suffer then. I'm without a mum. Do you know what I mean? I can't press charges and say, oh, she's done this or she's done that, even though I did tell Sally, like, who told the police, but I said I didn't want anything to come from it. But, but I love her. She's my mum. I think if I could find a way to change it, I'd change it now. But I can't find a way to change it. <laughs> it's like there's no hope, nothing there, nothing to work towards. Nan and Grandad aren't bothered. My nan told me, you can do what you want, I've given up with you. My mum ain't bothered, my dad ain't arse. Lorna, dad's girlfriend, just got me smoking loads of pot, getting on the bongs and stuff. You should see what they're smoking. Oh, it's nasty. Started knocking around with Sue, you know, smackhead Sue. Her is with my, mum, my mother. She got me smoking on the crack. Yeah, she's chosen that little smackhead over me again. She does it all the time. So what this tells us, um, and what, what we notice from many young people, and I do indeed ourselves, because I think I've put myself onto this model of empowerment, um, is a recycling. And this is um, a phase where it's all, it all may be going well, but you are likely to recycle back around to this reactive place. It happens to all of us, and it happens to Gemma, when the network she's within um, are so, so pressurised and so negative, I think, in this instance, that she recycles back round to this uh, reactive place. Um, and she just can't cope with it. Um, and this, for Gemma, happened once she was up in this top area of the model. But it can happen at other places, I think. Um, it, it could happen just after a spark or in the wanting phase. It can happen anywhere where you might want something, but you just can't do anything about it. Um, and that makes you recycle back round into the... Um, the reactive self, because you just have to cope. Um, and this has really close links with social mobility and things like that, um, but we're not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to um, finish Gemma's story. When I next met up with Gemma, her support worker Sally and I went to Mum's house to pick her up. It was a small upstairs flat, two bedrooms. It stank of bleach. Clean, I thought. Later I found out that this was to cover up the smell of crack, a very sweet type smell, I found out. A door was hanging off its hinge. I looked in, a mattress on the floor, stuff everywhere, and next to it several discarded needles. Gemma told us later her mum had just had a crack pipe. I had noticed our eyes were bulging out of her head. We all went to McDonald's. She said, like there's eight of us living in a two-bedroom flat and I have to share a room with my ex-boyfriend. I just don't think it's right. I think the only way I can do it, the only way I can change and get things around is if I don't see my mum, I don't see my dad, and I've got to cut them off totally and just stick with my nan and my granddad because they're the best people for me at the moment. Well, even though my granddad drinks. But where could I go? Where could I go without her knowing where I am? It wouldn't be easy at the start, but it would be easier by the end for me to cut them off and stay away. I'd worry though, but I wouldn't know things, like I wouldn't know the things I know now. And I could go back in five, ten years, and she'd be clean. Or she could be the same, but I'd be settled. But I don't know, it just depends. I've got to do it, no one else is going to do it. 
I think what that last part of Gemma's story tells us is her determination. And I think even though we've got this recycling phase back on the model on the model here, taking us back to the reactive self, once you're back at that reactive self, you're not the same person because of the experiences you've had, even if that was just a spark. Um, so we think that you're much likely to be able to travel back up through, uh, through the model um, and towards empowerment. Um, but it's not to say that you won't recycle back around. And actually, therefore, I think recycling is a positive thing. It's important that we go back round there and we learn from our experiences. Um, and this is where there's so many close links with experiential learning. Um, but it's not a linear model, this. It's, um, we're not rose-tinted glasses. We're really aware that this is cyclical. And, um, and sometimes people have suggested that maybe you have multiple models going on. Um, but we can discuss that potentially later. Um, Phil, if you could advance the slide. Um, what we felt this taught us um, and what we noticed about it was this was the personal, we think, starting to question, um, to challenge. Um, and we, we looked at the work of Paolo Freire and his interest in critical consciousness. And I believe this was um, a process of self-awareness leading to critical consciousness where she started to question and challenge, be critical with the world and the personal becoming political. Um, Phil, if you could advance the slide. What um, Margaret Ledworth teaches us about this, um, based amongst other on the works of Paolo Freire, is the personal becoming collective. And I think we saw this in Gemma's story, um, because her story was one of many. And she, she said in her story about one of the young women on the course with her and what that taught her about being in foster care. And that was actually the catalyst for her to say, no, I'm going to seek the help of services here. Um, and what Margaret Ledwith calls this is collective narratives for change. And I think that's really helpful for us to understand this and to understand collective action. Phil, you could move the side on. So what collective action is and what Margaret uh, Ledwith goes on to tell us is autonomy and action gather strength in a collective process. And that certainly happened for Gemma with her friend Billy amongst other people. Um, Margaret says, the simple act of listening to people's stories, respectfully giving one's full attention, is an act of personal empowerment. But to bring about change for social justice, the process needs to be collective and needs to be located within wider structures. And I think this is where it's really important, the personal becoming political, but also the person, personal becoming collective and working with others and learning that they're not the only one. Um, that this is happening to, and really gaining momentum through that collective. Um, and what that really closely links with is Kaz's work, where she's gone on to understand this and is really helpful her work to understand these wider structures. So, Kaz, I'm going to hand over to you. Great, thank you. Um, my research came from a very different starting point. I was interested in finding out how people across the children's workforce to help police officers, health workers, community workers, social workers and teachers could help affect positive change for children that they were looking after. Um, and whilst Lucy's model started as an individual model helping to explain a process of change for a young person, I found that the, the empowerment model was really helpful in understanding what was happening for these groups of professionals. So um, all I did was uh, change the name and talk about collective empowerment um, and use the model as a, a collective model. So I saw that teams of people were coming together and they were either reactive or, or proactive. They um, sometimes needed um, sparks to happen for them to enable them to feel they could move on and make change. We thought about Gemma and Gemma's story and from the work that I've been doing with practitioners we looked at all the things that they reported as getting in the way or helping them collaborate to create change. And a whole number of structures seemed to emerge that were getting in people's way. Uh, Phil, if you could move the slide on, please. So um, I mapped these as four different types of structures. And they might seem as if they're four levels of structures, but actually none of these is any more important than another and they don't sit in a hierarchy at all. 
Um, the first level of practice I identified was, sorry, the first level of structure was microstructures. These were the things that people did in their day-to-day -day lives. They were their day-to-day -day practice together. So practitioners talked about the actions that they took to try and support children and young people and the actions that they took to try and work with each other. The next level that came, became really clear were the meso-level structures. This is like a, a middle level. In the work that I did, this looked like the um, enabling and constraining structures that were around either different organisations or different professions. So some organisations had set ways of working, they had guidebooks and protocols and rules that people had to follow. And in other um, settings, different professions had different ways of working. They had different views about children and young people, different forms of practice, and they governed what people did. Another type of structure was a macro level structure. These are the really big structures that we operate within. So these included things like national law, different policies, different guidance that people had to follow, and also included things that we might call discourses. Um, a discourse is something like a message that there is around in society. And people in the children's workforce reported that they felt deprofessionalized, that they felt as if nobody trusted them, that they felt as if they had to be afraid. And these were all examples of discourses or messages that they were picking up from society. I then also thought that the people that the practitioners were working with, they also created another level of structure. So sometimes the people that we worked with were very open to change and really wanted people to come on board and help them. A great example of that would be Gemma and her willingness to engage and wanting people to support her. But at other times, the people that we worked with were very close to change and didn't want anybody involved in their lives. Um, so it was interesting that when people talked about these structures, there was evidence of all four of these structures at play. But predominantly, people talked about the structures that were getting in the way, the structures that were constraining them. I went back to the data and I looked really hard, and then I started finding examples tiny examples of where structures were sometimes helpful and enabling. And so I've mapped these into um, the table which is on the next slide, please, Phil. Could you advance? Thank you. So here um, there are these four different types of structures and you can see that for some people the same structure was for one person enabling and for another person constraining. So people said, oh, I really hate this policy. It's really getting in my way. It's stopping me doing what I want to do. Yet for somebody else, that same structure was really enabling. It gave them an opportunity to work in the way that they wanted to. Some people responding to organizational changes, which in the last two or three years have usually been a lack of resources and funding. Some people found that that lack of resources meant that they had to work together more closely. So they felt it helped them collaborate. Whereas other people said, now we don't have the resources, we don't have the time, we don't have the, any possibility of working together. At the um, micro level of practice, some people found that working together and each other's working styles were really complementary and it really helped them gain more, to gain collaborative advantage by working together. But for others, they found that different people's working styles or interpersonal difficulties got in the way and trying to work together actually made everything harder and they experienced collaborative inertia. And then we come to um, the level of the beneficiaries and as I said some people really wanted practitioners to come along and help them and other people didn't. So what's key about this is that there are a number of structures that people are situated in. So we could take Gemma and her experience of empowerment and we could take that and place it in the centre of a model of structures. And so um, I've tried to show those in the next slide. So here we can see um, these four different types of structures. I've tried to use everyday language so that I can use this uh, model with uh, practitioners and beneficiaries out in the field. I've put a Celtic knot in the middle to try and show that these four structures interact with each other. They enable and constrain each other and there's a flow 
So some structures reinforce each other and other structures um, help each other out. So for example, a national change in policy might mean that organisational cultures and norms change, that might mean that people's practice changes, and that might mean that beneficiaries experience us in a different way. So they all seem to interrelate. So I was really curious, we have um, people who potentially feel empowered or disempowered and they are situated against these um, structures. So I wondered how it was that people ever managed to do anything, particularly when they were working together collaboratively. So that really turned my attention to looking at agency. Um, could you advance the slide please, Phil? Thanks very much. So agency isn't a new thing. It's a term that's only just emerging, I think, in um, social care practice. But as you see from this first quote, um, George Mead talked about agency back in 1913. He said it was really important that individuals were conceptualized as being personally agentic and yet socially shaped over time. So even back in 1913, he was seeing that people had the ability to change things but people were also shaped by the situations that they found themselves in. And here we have the classic structure and agency debate. Are people shaped by the structures that they live in or do people create the structures that they live in? And these are two opposite views. Um, Jeffrey talks about agency as being the ability of individuals or groups to act on their situations to behave as subjects rather than objects in their own lives, to shape their own circumstances and ultimately achieve change. This was exactly the idea of agency that I felt to be really important. So whilst we might be situated in a range of structures, we do have potential to change, we do have potential to be empowered and to take responsibility for what happens to us. So I continued reading around and um, looking at structure and agency forced me into a whole new library of sociology uh, but I've tried to boil agency down to three key things which are shown on the next slide. So agency seemed to involve people having awareness. It was really important that people had awareness of the structures that they were in and of themselves. From that awareness they then took choices. They made choices about what they would do. They would select one course of action over another in the light of the awareness that they had. They also um, then took action. Now that's quite easy to understand in terms of an individual like Gemma, but talking about having collective awareness, collective choices, and acting in a collective way in terms of people collaborating, was much more difficult and I think it takes a lot of time and energy and effort to create teams of people who can do those three things in a very shared and equitable way. Can you advance the slide please Phil? So working together in these ways um, helped me to come up with um, a notion of empowerment. So I drew on these different uh, descriptions of what, um, of what agency was and what it might look like. And this led me to uh, create a final uh, slide that shows how agency operates. If you could advance the slide, please. So here we can see at the bottom that people are coming together and um, they're working together with a shared goal. So the first difficulty in working together collaboratively is trying to get a team of people who can equitably decide on a shared goal and who can all commit to it, putting their personal interests aside. Then they need to have awareness and the awareness uh, takes three forms being awareness of um, the context that they're in, awareness of the things that they might do, an awareness of ways in which they can affect change. And those three levels of awareness are really important, which is where critical consciousness, um, dialogue, critical pedagogy, all are really vital tools in working together collaboratively. Once the team have collectively come to a shared understanding of the possibilities, they then need to commit to a collective course of action. 
and that might take some time. It's quite sophisticated for teams to um, come to a collective and agreed action that everybody's happy with. And then the final step where many of the teams that I worked with fell down was that they would all agree what to do within the meeting and then after the meeting <laughs> they'd leave the room and then go and do individual things. So one of the key challenges was turning this personal, this personal experience and the shared agreement into a collective acting, making things different. But when they did this, there was really powerful change that happened. So we were really excited when um, Lucy and myself brought our ideas together. Lucy's empowerment model had really come from a youth development context, working with young people. Um, my ideas around structure and agency had come from a professional setting, working with collective groups of um, pr practitioners. But when we brought them together, we saw that empowerment led people to having a sense of agency, which meant that they could affect changes in the environment that they were working in. So agency had an impact on the structures. If people used their agency in a powerful way, then they could change things for the better, and that would then enable them to feel more empowered, and that would then increase their agency again. It was as if there became a virtuous cycle of empowerment. And agents and agency leading to social change. And we noticed that this model could work from an individual setting with young people, from an individual setting with practitioners, and from a collective setting either with young people or practitioners. So we'd be really interested in hearing your views. And Lucy, I don't know if you're ready to address some of the questions. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much indeed, both of you. Thank you very much indeed, both of you. That was fantastic. And uh, I really found that clear, interesting, and thought-provoking. And I've got a question for Lucy to start us off, and then maybe other people want to type their questions to Ramon. She'll pass them on. Um, I'll ask the first question. Um, Lucy, you mentioned recycling. What do we do in the recycling phase to help people through it? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I'm really pleased someone asked it because um, recycling was something I thought about a lot. Just the language I used with it, actually, calling it recycling rather than um, other people have called it um, relapse or regression. And actually, I didn't see it as that at all um, because we started to see it as inevitable. And actually, if it's inevitable, we have to work with it. And so as practitioners, how do we work with that then? Um, and actually, maybe we just need to start by reframing it into it's inevitable, so maybe is it positive? Um, and so we just need to work through, through it with people, understanding it will come, and maybe preparing them for the fact that it will come. Um, and knowing that that is a normal part of any process and, and actually could be seen as quite healthy. Um, and so some of the people like um, Di Clementi and his, his colleagues um, who, where I got the idea of recycling round, they called it regression or relapse. And I wasn't prepared to call it that because I, d I didn't see it as negative. Um, so in answering the question, how, how do we help in that phase? I guess we just need to know it's, it's going to happen and work with people and make them aware that it's going to happen um, and help them through it be alongside them as we are alongside it, the whole of the model um, we can't tell people at any point that's the point of the model that it's it's intrinsic um, but what we can do is if we have this broader understanding of the process of empowerment and the model I think helps us at that level helps us understand it as a process and then it can help us frame practice around that and recycling is going to be a part of practice Lovely, thank you. Uh, we do have one question, well not a question as such, but just a comment from Kate McLean just saying it is um, extraordinary the experiences that are shared when people are given permission to share in a non-judgmental way. Um, Phil's going to take over in terms of looking at questions because my connections um, on Discuss is, is uh, having a few issues, so I'll, I'll let Phil move on with that. I'd like to make a comment about that actually because I think it is extraordinary as well. Um, I think that this whole presentation started with one young woman's story 
um, and it's grown um, into kind of understanding the process of empowerment, understanding the model of empowerment as a framework for practice and potentially I think uh, critiquing practice and policy um, I think um, and then it's grown into wider applications as as well as kind of the wider structures and understandings of that um, so from from the personal to the collective to multi-agency teams and it all started with one young woman's story um, and I think the power of that we need to celebrate that and that's what I believe Margaret Legwith was talking about in her collective narratives for change. I think we've really exemplified that in this. I think that it's uh, really interesting as well that the model, whilst we started both using it as uh, a way to research, or it came out of our research, what we both found was that we had to examine our own sense of empowerment and our own sense of agency and we had to take a good hard look at the structures that were operating on us. I found it really interesting to think about the things that not only uh, held me back and constrained me but also to spend time focusing on the things that helped me do what I wanted to do and there is something about jointly problem solving, jointly thinking, jointly sharing experiences that I found a really enabling structure to be in and I certainly felt um, much more empowered by working in a collective way <clears throat> and it's really levered my agency to be able to complete my research. I think both of us have found that there's been a parallel process that working on empowerment and agency with people in real settings has actually helped us think about and consolidate our own sense of empowerment and agency. I think just before Phil asks another question, there's, there's something I, I'd like to add to that. Um, and that, it brings up um, the thing I hinted at earlier about Gemma's language um, in her story. Um, and we had a debate about this, um, about um, I've never changed Gemma's language previously. I've just given a bit of a health warning um, about how it's pretty colourful language and the content is could be emotional for people. Um, however, I did change the language today, um, and that's because this is being streamed live and um, it's under the structures, maybe, um, of the university and whether, whether that's okay for everybody. And um, I'm not sure if um, how I feel about that. I feel pretty uncomfortable about changing Gemma's language for the first time. Um, and what the power, how that affects the power, because previously um, Gemma had chosen exactly how she wanted to tell her story um, and was completely in control of it the whole time. We had a shared power, I think, um, and for the first time today I've changed that and uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. It feels like I've taken uh, control away from her, um, but I think that's uh, one for people to think about. That's... Uh, that's really interesting um, because that fits in with um, a question um, here um, from uh, Craig2791. Um, he says, um, in my own practice I find there is a fine line um, between working with others to help develop their critical consciousness and inadvertently brainwashing them. Any thoughts? Um, I, I guess that's linking in with um, where where the empowerment lies. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Well, I can start, Cash. You can take over if you like. Um, I definitely thought a lot about the brainwashing thing, um, and not just with um, the young people we were working with, but also with the practitioners, because we were developing this um, the momentum of this idea, and I was taking it on, and we were developing it very mutually and together. Uh, that I was going away and, and doing some reading and bringing it back in and saying, oh, what about this? Is this what we mean? And um, kind of being that resource. And I was very worried that I was uh, brainwashing people and saying with with my ideas. Um, and I, I don't really know how, how I work with that. Um, I guess we work as, with, as a mirror um, and a mirroring things and saying, oh, this is what I've seen, what have you seen and things like that. Um, but I think it is definitely a problem, the worry of brainwashing. Um, and taking our ideas where we think they are are going, um, and that's not actually where the participants thought they were going. Kaz, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. 
Yeah, it, it made me think about the importance of reflective practice and being reflexive. So <clears throat> absolutely, I think you're right. There is, there is a very fine line between the two. And it's really tricky to recognize when you might be near that line or, or straying over it. Um, so for me, I spent um, quite a bit of time thinking about myself, what my drivers were, <clears throat> if I had any agendas, what previous experiences I had that might lead me to read things in certain ways or work with groups in certain ways. <clears throat> and that constant interrogation really between what am I doing and what is there in me that might be encouraging me to work in that way was really important to helping me keep a check on power. Um, and I think uh, Margaret Ledwood's got a really useful power matrix um, in some of her materials, which <clears throat> is a useful check-in to help you work out whether you are being um, unintentionally oppressive in any way, or if you really are in shared equitable practice. <clears throat> Have we got any other questions? Uh, hi, I thought um, Karen had a question. Um, <clears throat> Have you got a question, Karen? Yes, I've got a question for Kaz. You talked about, um, when you're talking about agency, you talked about us being subjects or objects in our lives. And I wondered what you thought made us that way. <laughs> That's an interesting question. <clears throat> I think I, I read quite a lot about um, people having multiple subjectivities. Um, and so it, there, even within that, there are shades of positions. So, for example, I might have different positions in relation to what's happening with the government in terms of who I am personally, who I am as an individual in my workplace, who I am as a collective with other people in the workplace. And each of those subjectivities, each of my views, might be different. Um, and I think that from the work that I did, people's sense of whether they were subject to structures and subject to the things that were happening in their lives or whether they were able to be um, active and, and take control of them really was, you know, empowerment was really fundamental to that. Um, the people who seem to be more disempowered seem to report things happening to them. They um, positioned themselves very much as victims of the things that were happening. And um, I got very interested in the narratives and the ways that they constructed their narratives. And their narratives were definitely <clears throat> all about things happening to them and being almost caught up in a web, web of inevitability in their lives as professionals. So that made me wonder about the opportunities that we have to work with groups of people to help them reauthor and re-narrate their stories in ways that gave them more agency that positioned them as um, being more subjects able to uh, effect change. And so I think that in some respects it, the way that we author ourselves might influence the extent to which we're either subjects or objects of our lives. So there's really interesting things about um, positioning and um, narration and life story work. Lucy, yeah. did you did you have any sense of that from the work that you did with Gemma? Oh, I was reading something else, so I wasn't concentrated on your last question. <laughs> <laughs> I think Phil's got a question. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just wondering whether you might have um, in part uh, addressed it already, Kaz. Um, I've got a question here from Dave Valentine. Um, he's just saying, um, thinking about past work with young people, it seems to me we often took individuals to high levels of awareness and wanting to take action but often failed to get them to the stage of collective action because it was so difficult to take control or have influence together. Uh, there was so much acting against them sending them back in this recycling stage. Um, so he's asking can you elaborate on trying, um, trying to overcome this move from individual to collective action? Lucy do you want to Yeah. It? I can go first. <laughs> um, I really reflect that actually, uh, felt that a lot. Um, and I think I was really quite concerned about having to focus so much on the personal um, and not ever being able to get to the collective. Um, but knowing how powerful the collective was, 
Um, and so I do think it's really hard, and I absolutely resonate with the the structures that are pushing on onto some young people. I think it's so hard to do that, um, and I don't know if I have any answers about how we can support them to become collective. Um, that just bringing people together, we found in our work, um, uh, a lot of our work, and in particular this project, um, wasn't just community work, it was on residential settings. Um, and that being a way, um, and we've done some third space work about um, what it means to actually be a way and in a different space and how helpful that is to be a way with similar others. Um, was very helpful um, and I think the power of residential experiences can be but I also think that that's helpful in community settings because you will be away in a sense if you're working with a youth group um, because they might be away from those pressures um, that normally surround them in everyday life and Gemma called that um, people listening to her for the first time um, and and that wasn't just us as workers, that was uh, the people she was in the group with and she suddenly realised that other people were going through similar things and that was incredibly powerful. So maybe it's our position is about creating space, creating time and space for people to be able to um, share those things, share those narratives for change and become collective. Um, I don't know, Kaz, do you have anything? Well, that really resonates with um, the work with professionals. Um, they constantly talked about the luxury of having time to stop and think um, and actually engaging in participative action research. They were able to spend prolonged periods of time looking at what was happening for them um, and that alone was powerful. So coming together in a, a third space to think was really powerful. Um, the second feature of their work was when they got to a stage where they really could trust each other and could really share in open um, dialogue with one another. And that's really difficult with young people to get them to that point where they might be able to work in that way. Um, and I wouldn't say it's any easier actually with a team of practitioners. <laughs> they often have a whole load of baggage that gets in the way. Um, but the second factor was this, yeah, being able to talk honestly and openly, having a good level of trust with each other. Um, and then the third factor that was important for the uh, professionals I worked with was having a way of mapping what was happening to them. So instead of trying to reduce the complexity of their life into a, a simple list of bullet points or a simple list of ideas, um, they created quite complex maps um, and they did system mapping. So they tried to identify all the different things that were happening in their lives at all those different levels and then they drew lines between them to show where there were conflicts, where some of the structures were keeping them where they were. Sometimes there were double binds where there was a kind of a no-win situation. If they acted in one way, then children and people didn't benefit. If they acted in the other way, then practitioners wouldn't benefit. Um, so that was the third part, really, um, was giving them tools with which they could make sense of the mess and the complexity. And, you know, human beings are really natural. Once, once they've got a map and a way of seeing what's happening, they straight away start coming up with solutions and ideas of, of what to do next. And then they work together really um, productively as a team. Where they could really see what they could do together to make the whole system work better. How that translates to young people, I don't know. <laughs> Have we got any more questions, Phil and Ramon? Okay, um, that was good timing. One just flew in um, just as you uh, asked. Um, it's Craig2791 again. Um, comment for Lucy related to her concerns about changing Gemma's language. Um, quote, I think that's uh, that honesty is the important thing in such situations. If you are still working slash in touch with people, then you can discuss your quandary with them beforehand and come to some conclusion about how to proceed. If you are not able to speak with them, then you can be honest with your audience as you have been. Uh, either way, you are showing due respect for the people you are working slash have worked with, and in my mind, you can't say fairer than that. That's very kind. <laughs> I think it it just uh, brought up uh, the power issue, I think, um, that previously I just 
really tried so hard to make it equal and I'm fully aware it can never be equal and it's so complex um, but it, it does throw up that power issue um, and particularly in Gemma's story um, and I think generally with young people in the striving to gain power and um, she was so disempowered um, to take her language and change it just it seems to be adding to her disempowerment um, particularly when she was an empowered person now um, and, and she did go on to be incredibly empowered and uh, has sustained that. I'm not in contact with her anymore um, and haven't been for a year but I was in contact for four years so that felt like quite a long time and I was very privileged to have that. Um, so thank you for your comments. <laughs> um, I, I actually, if um, I don't know if there's any more questions, are there any? Because I'd like to, I've got a couple. <laughs> Have you got any questions, Phil? Um, I'm just reading, something's popped up. I'm just reading whether it's a question or not. Um, I think it's more of a comment. I could read it out if you want. Yes, please. Um, this is from Katie. Um, says This is a really powerful way of thinking about reworking the ways in which children's services brackets, statutory and increasingly important third sector, close brackets, managerial structures so that they become more enabling, consciously and explicitly, rather than taking power away from managers, practitioners and beneficiaries. Uh, policies can become less paternalistic, funding should support these ways of working. Yeah, absolutely. And I um, at one point had a version of uh, the model of agency and structure that I, I titled Reclaiming Our Expertise. <laughs> and I really felt, you know, having kind of got to grips with structure and agency, I just thought, wow, wow, this is it. This is how we um, get back our expertise, how we affect structures, how we start um, changing uh, the children's services environment for the better. So, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I've sent it to every minister in the UK and <laughs> not had many responses, but I had a few responses. So I'm, I'm having a mini revolution all of my own. I think I'd probably add to that as well um, in as much as I, I believe that um, some language that is used in um, practice, uh, in day-to-day -day practice, uh, organisationally and I think in policy, um, it's maybe using the words empowerment and agency, um, but maybe isn't actually understanding them in the same way that I would understand them. And so kind of in unpacking it all, I've come to be quite critical of some people that are saying empowerment, but actually I'm not sure that's what they're doing. And that's, I think, the problem when um, empowerment and agency become could become buzzwords. Um, and, and I think that's quite scary. So we need to be critical and have a wide understanding um, so as we can look at policy and practice um, and be able to critique it um, and question it. Um, and I think that probably leads to one of the questions that we posed at the end on our la one of our last slides um, about language. Um, and I think that is all through all of the levels in our day-to-day -day language as well as all the way through to policy. Um, and even uh, the, the example I'd like to use is the title of this presentation um, is Empowering Young Women, um, when actually I, I think that's a contradiction. Um, I don't believe we can empower others. Um, and I think we hear that a lot um, in policy and I think certainly um, in practice. And it might come from um, a positive place or a, good, a place of good intent, um, but actually it's a contradiction, I believe, to say we will empower others because that is you asserting your power over the other person saying you will give them power. And actually power is an intrinsic process. Um, and so one can't empower another one. Um, and so I... I think we should be careful with the language that we use because it does reflect our thoughts and values and, and our practice. Have you got anything to add to that, Kaz? Uh, no, I think that's, that's really useful. Um, and I think there is a danger of all of these terms potentially being um, taken and, and used out of context like so many others have been appropriated. Um, you know, the, I, I certainly don't agree with the government's use of the term social justice at the moment. And yet, you know, social justice is something that we're all supposed to understand and have a shared perception of. And, you know, I, in another couple of years' time, then 
um, empowerment and agency might be appropriated <laughs> and used to ill ends as well. So it's up to us to be uh, the word warriors um, and really, you know, stick to what we mean and, and defend the true meanings of some of these terms. Okay, that, I think that brings us to an end because we've reached the end of our recording time. But I, I think as, with us as word warriors, it's a really good note to end on. And I'd really like to thank Kaz and Lucy very much for such an exciting presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I've got lots, it's made me think about lots of different things. So that's really great. Thank you very much indeed. And maybe we can now go off air, Phil. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone.